upsetting. I know, shocking. Um, but we're going to go ahead and, and open the Gladstone School Board City Council Joint Work Session for uh, Wednesday, May 22nd at 5.41 p.m. So um, we will start with, um, we, you probably have an agenda in front of you. And we'll go ahead and then just go around and uh, introduce the City Council and School Board members quickly for those of us who don't know one another. And then we have some guests here as well that will be on agenda item number two so bob would you like to start okay uh bob stewart superintendent of classroom school district for 37 more days <laughs> <laughs> not that anyone's count <laughs> greg alexander gladstone city council matt parkin school board john schmerber police department robbie teague sro also long school board Jeremiah Patterson, Assistant Superintendent. Soon to be. Uh, Tracy Obergrant, School Board. Michael Milch, Mayor. Jackie Vett, City Administrator. Donna Diggs, School Board. Vanessa Huckabee, City Councilor. Charlie Chu, School Board. Luke Roberts, School Board. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> Mindy Garlington, City Council. <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to introduce um, behind us here, we have some. Um, Orlando Perez and I have been friends for a while. He was on the North Clackamas School Board and Orlando and Laura and Justine are all part of the Oregon City Children's um, Center. And they're gonna do a presentation with us today. And we're very excited to have them. It's a wonderful organization. I've been to a few functions with them. So um, I think we have, oh, I lost Jennifer. There she is. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves to and then um and then we have a video presentation as well. Do you guys want to go like kind of yeah yeah well, yeah yeah there we go. And thank you for being here. So nice. Thank glad you're here. Yeah, we're very honored to be here. Uh, my name is Laura Simpson Black, and I'm the Director of Prevention and Community Engagement for the Children's Center. Right. I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do, but let have my colleagues at least themselves too. Um, and my name is Justine Kovac. I'm the outreach specialist at Children's Center and we'll talk more about what that means. And uh, I'm Orlando Perez. I'm a Children's Center. Children's Center Board of Directors. And uh, Peter, thank you for having us. <laughs> okay, so we just have a short presentation. Um, and um, welcome your questions as I go if you have them. So Children's Center is what's called a child advocacy center. And um, there are uh, 24 of them throughout the state of Oregon. Children or child advocacy centers are nationwide. They're in fact, even a few internationally. And they are um, organizations that were established to support children and families that are experiencing child maltreatment, abuse and neglect. And um, we are um, a private nonprofit. We've been around for about 20 years, over 20 years. And um, we were established to really be a place where um, children and families, when they're involved um, in an investigation related to child abuse and neglect, where they could come, where services are really wrapped around that child and family, they tell their story one time. And um, all of the service providers that are supporting that investigation and supporting that child, so um, law enforcement and the district attorney's office and currently human services, if they're involved, they have come to us and to that family. And um, so that the child only needs to tell their story one time. Um, we work in a very trauma-informed way. Um, and uh, it really was in response to kind of uh, poorly coordinated um, services uh, for children and families where they had to go and they would tell their story to law enforcement and then to the Department of Human Services, and then they would see a medical provider and things of that nature. So uh, uh, there, we are part of a multidisciplinary team, which is something required by state law. Um, Federal law, okay. Yeah, I think it looks different. State state. It looks a little different. Okay, I'm newish to the. I'm here for a year, so that just occurred to me. Um, 
but we're required by law to coordinate those services and to, we meet frequently with those partners. Um, and again, Children's Center is kind of the hub of that work of this multidisciplinary team. We have a mission to work with the community to end abuse and neglect through assessment, treatment, and prevention. And we are working to build a world where all children feel safe, valued, and hurt. Children's Center provides about 500 uh, assessments each year. These are very thorough um, head-to-toe medical exams, um, forensic interviews, again, where that child, when able, a child of an appropriate age anyway, um, would tell their story. Um, we provide family support services that really um, address the needs of the family. I, I should say the safe caregivers who are um, to um, do that intervention. And um, so and again, they give um, their interview and all of the service providers come to the Children's Center to kind of support and wrap around that. Something that's really important to know is that um, children, have um, maximum control over their experience at the Children's Center when they come in. Um, they have experienced, um, unfortunately, incidents that take away all and autonomy. And so we are very thoughtful about, um, in a trauma-informed way, um, putting a lot of control back into the hands of the child. So if they're old enough to consent individually, they have to get, give that consent if they're over 15 individually. But even, um, even if they're younger that, than that age and a, and a safe parent brings them in, that child still really has to sort of agree to be examined. If they're uncomfortable, that doesn't happen. If they are not prepared to talk, um, they are not forced to talk, obviously. So uh, it's a very trauma-informed approach to doing those assessments. Um, every child advocacy center has that fundamental um, a role to provide those assessments um, when there's a concern of abuse and neglect. In addition, many of them, including the Children's Center, provide therapy services. We provide what's called trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy um, for children um, and their and caregivers um, to support them after um, this investigation. And um, they uh, are seen for as long as they need to be seen. Um, we do not charge for any of our services. The medical services we do bill for um, insurance when we can, same with therapy services, but we do not have a limit on like 12 visits. Have you children are seen as long as they need to be seen. And so if we exceed um, insurance requirements, we make up um, the balance of that through fundraising and grant writing. And then in addition, prevention, I direct our prevention program. Um, it is um, sort of newly expanded. We have always done a lot of um, prevention services in the community, most notably um, a really um, uh, intensive um, curriculum around child sexual abuse prevention called Stewards of Children. You may be familiar with it. We do still do that. We've done that for a long time. And in addition, we are growing and providing additional um, trainings um, out in the community geared towards parents. We don't, uh, we have some partners who do a lot of work in the classrooms and I don't know, frankly, if um, in Gladstone, you guys work with Clackamas Women's Services that does a curriculum uh, that's directly um, with children in the classroom. Um, but we, our space is really working with parents and caregivers um, around how to keep kids safe. Um, you can see we um, the reasons for referral, um, the ages, and uh, male-female distribution, just some additional statistics. Uh, I will just note that um, our, our organization is really set up to support particularly um, and required to do examinations when there are concerns of physical and sexual abuse. We have a higher proportion of that than um, is generally the case of incidents of abuse and neglect in um, the state and country. So we serve a very high proportion of that. And you may note that that number exceeds 100% because a lot of kids are presenting with multiple reasons for trauma. Okay, so we're going to move on to prevention and community engagement because this is really what we're excited to share. That's obviously a very sobering, uh, sobering topic. And 
that core of our work around assessment and therapy. And what we're here to really talk about is that prevention is possible if our community works together to keep kids safe and to learn about how to um, uh, create healthy and resilient kids and families. So that's what we're here talking about tonight. Our department mission is to inspire, engage, and support our community to be educated advocates to protect children and their well-being. So my colleague Justine is going to pick it up from here, and um, but we can all address questions as we can. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Laura. Um, so yeah, as as Laura mentioned, it's been a really exciting like last year, year and a half of so we've kind of expanded our prevention and community engagement department, um, and I've so enjoyed getting to be a part of that work. Um, and so as Laura said, you know we know that child abuse is preventable, and it's not just an individual or family level issue; it's a societal issue. And so the solutions then, of course, have to function at all those levels. We can't just say, oh, parents need to do better or schools need to do better, it takes all of us. And so when we look um, at kind of what our goals are, we're really kind of looking at each of those levels. Um, so strengthening knowledge and skills, right? Really looking at that caregivers and professionals working with kids need to know, um, like understanding warning signs of abuse, as Laura mentioned, some of our child sex prevention curriculum, right? Understanding um, the issues of maltreatment. Um, Fostering coalitions and networks, right, is really about that next community level of how are we working together in partnership with all of the different places and spaces that our kids and families are um, and bringing everyone together um, to create shared goals um, and increase all of our knowledge, but also kind of think about solutions together. Um, and then the leading systems that heal, right, is that next level, that systemic level, thinking about policy, like child and family friendly policies um, and kind of advocacy work at that systems level um, and also increasing awareness. So April was Child Abuse Prevention Month and we did a lot of engagement in the community, but also just like on social media, right, kind of sharing messages around prevention and hope and healing um, and reaching um, everyone in our community. When we think about prevention, we kind of, there's multiple different levels we can think about, but we're really focused in our prevention department about primary prevention. And that really means working upstream to prevent abuse and maltreatment before it even happens. So as Laura shared, we also provide services that support kids and families after harm has happened. Um, but our prevention department is really focused on, again, getting upstream to prevent harm from happening in the first place. Um, and so the core kind of framework of prevention around abuse and neglect are really these three kind of key points, right? Kids need healthy relationships with peers and with caregivers and with safe adults, healthy development, right? And adults who can support them if they're not on track developmentally um, and safe environments. Uh, and I know I look at this list and think about all of the ways that our schools are providing all of those three um, kind of core factors. So we talked about the knowledge and skills and Laura mentioned, you know, that we've for many years provided the stewards of children curriculum. Um, but these are some of the other trainings and resources we've kind of been, um, again, increasing our capacity to provide in the community. Um, so again, doing that Children's Center 101, um, a little bit of the information like we're offering here today to make sure folks are aware of the resources in the community. Um, and we also have been um, partnering with folks at the Oregon Department of Human Services to provide in-person mandatory reporting trainings. Um, we know sometimes folks you know, are required to watch a little video or do a short online training, but we found that that really doesn't get at all of the nuances around what it really means to um, be a mandatory reporter and when you should call the hotline and what that feels like. Um, we um, kind of in collaboration with our therapy team um, have a great training around just understanding the impacts of trauma on kids and what that looks like. Um, our Healthy Boundaries and Behaviors program and training is part of um, my work and that's around kind of increasing our knowledge around child sexual development um, and making sure we all are prepared to respond appropriately when children exhibit problematic sexual behaviors because we know that kids and teens can engage in sexual behaviors that harm others as well. And we need to kind of understand and provide developmentally appropriate intervention when that happens. Being a Goldilocks caregiver in the digital age is a little bit of what it hopefully sounds like that um, digital life is a uh, part of parenting. It's part of educating, right? We live in the digital age and we know that abuse happens online too. 
Um, and so that really is around increasing knowledge and capacity and skills to support kids in being safe online uh, and understanding and building capacity um, to support kids. Raising resilient children is another one that we've been offering more recently around understanding protective factors and understanding skills that we can, that all parents, all caregivers, all adults who work with kids can help nurturing kids, again, regardless um, if, if abuses happened or not, um, those skills that help all of us be resilient, um, regardless of kind of what happens in our lives. And I think this is another place where we welcome and want feedback about what other trainings, what other topic areas do you see um, in your communities um, that we might be able to offer? Again, as Laura said, we're in this exciting time of having increased capacity. And so really wanna be hearing and engaging with our partners um, around what's needed. Just to, uh, to speak a little more to that trauma mm -hmm. uh, training and that we're sort of literally today in conversations yeah. with um, the school district about how we could kind of adapt that for uh, their district and their educators to kind of uh, go beyond sort of the science of trauma, but yeah. also to speak about sort of uh, uh, strategies to address behavioral issues that, that come up in classrooms. Yeah, I think exactly that, as Laura said. Yeah, we just had a meeting today um, talking more about that. So I think, you know, it's not just, you know, for folks who are working directly with kids, like we all know, it's not just around the knowledge, but like the skills of in the moment, if you have a kid, you know, exhibiting a challenging behavior that might be part of a trauma response, how do you respond and how do you manage your own response to respond effectively? Um, and we know that relationships, right? We talked about the healthy relationships, like that's where that core component comes in um, of being those safe, supportive adults um, who can respond appropriately um, when those trauma symptoms might be showing up and do show up in the classroom. Um, that next level, the fostering coalitions and networks, one of the things we've been offering, um, gosh, for like a year and a half now, are quarterly community conversations and connections events. Um, these have been really awesome um, places and spaces where anyone who cares about kids, um, especially folks who are working with kids, um, come together, have some time for networking and just connection. We always have good food. Um, and then this year we're doing a speaker series um, of kind of bringing together partners, um, working on these issues in our community. So um, this is the information for our one coming up in July. Um, we have our partners from A Village for One that's here in Clackamas County, working with children who's, who have experienced commercial sexual exploitation. Um, so they're gonna share a little bit about that topic area and help us all kind of increase our knowledge. Um, about that as well. And then it, we've got several more kind of upcoming throughout the year um, with some other exciting topics. So how can you partner with us, right? That's part of the reason we're here. We don't just want to come kind of talk to you one time, um, but really want to focus on like, what are some of the things that we can offer you and how can we kind of collaborate with folks within the district? Um, so just, again, creating com uh, connections with our staff and our programs. Um, we're really looking at having, again, as Laura mentioned, we have those family support specialists <laughs> who provide support um, and consultation um, to caregivers and also professionals when there are concerns. Um, and we can provide that service even for families whose kids don't come in for assessment services. So any parent or caregiver can access that. Um, really making sure that everyone is aware of Children's Center and our services and referring folks um, to call our intake, our intake staff um, if you think it might be an appropriate service for a family. We welcome calls from professionals, but also from caregivers directly themselves. Um, so you can always encourage a concerned caregiver um, to give us a call. Participating in our Community Connection Series, we would love to invite and would welcome any um, of you to those events. Um, and then those trainings, right? As we said, we're really excited to have that capacity to come to communities, come to organizations um, and share um, the content that we have. And then again, hear from you about what else is missing. Um, and again, welcome your feedback and suggestions. We've got our contact information and I'm gonna pass it off, I think, to Orlando to wrap us up maybe. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll be quick. Are we able to go back to yes, which the line? statistics that we had yeah. like three days ago? That yeah, one. Right there. yeah, right there. So um, we had 493 assessments last year, and uh, that's just what's reported. 
there's a lot that's not recorded. Um, and you see the breakdown here, 49%, 33%, 19%, 25%. So the CDC came out and said one out of every 10 children is abused. Um, so if you think about that, so Gladstone School District has what, 1,600 students, give or take? Yep. So 1,600 divided by 10, 160 students in your school district. This is going on. They're going home in terror every day. So how, is, how as a village, how can we help these kids? Well, some of the tools that uh, Justine just had up provide things to look for, um, especially those that work with children, our teachers, our staff, um, especially in these cases, because a lot of times there's no physical. You got to look for other things, behavioral, uh, bad grades, what have you. Um, bad grades when they've been doing good. Um, so a lot of the trainings, which are only a couple hours, um, and it doesn't have to be with us, any kind of training, so you know what to look for. Otherwise, you got 160 students, give or take, you're in our school district, our school district that are. So our village, our job is to make that child feel valued. So the sick things or things that are happening to them, they don't have to go home and say, I, I deserve what's happening to me. Or, you know, I guess... I guess this is the way it's supposed to be. It's up to us as a village to recognize something going on and make them feel valued, cherished. So that what happens to them, what happens to them doesn't penetrate their skin and become a become part of their soul, become part of their story. We want to we want to keep it so it doesn't become a part of their story. And that's how we as a village we arm ourselves with tools to look for those kids that. Hey, are you doing okay? I, I noticed that you're a little off today. Everything okay? Because a lot of times kids, especially at the elementary level, will talk. Yeah. The last thing I'll say is uh, someone was once quoted as saying, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. I believe it was Frederick Douglass. But thank you. This is, it's a dark topic, but it's real. It's happening. It's happening all around us, fortunately. Thank you for having us tonight. Orlando, can I ask a question? I think when I was with you guys a couple of weeks ago, and just so you know, I, I found a few things up there. Kristen Eaton, who was our school board chair, is also part of, yes. uh, of a board big, big yeah. part of um, this. Um, <laughs> we went up there last time, Annette Hartman was there, um, a representative for Mark Meek was there. So this is a big important, I don't want to say reputable. I mean, it is reputable. It's, it's just a very important, um, well-run organization. If you get a chance to go up and tour, um, it's just right up uh, Willamette, not Willamette Falls. Willamette Falls. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Oregon City. So if you get a chance to go. But the one uh, that I think I remember you guys saying a month ago, whenever I was up there, was that the sexual abuse number is high because that's the one that children acknowledge. I don't know if I heard that. You know, that that's the one that they report the most. It doesn't mean that the other ones are less valued. Did I hear that right or there was something about that statistic being so so much larger than the others yeah and I yeah I, I think as Laura said earlier part of that comes down to kind of the mission and requirements of child advocacy centers being really um, intended and required to serve those kids um, but what we actually see when we look at like the incident incidents of child maltreatment concerns on a state and national level that actually neglect um, is consistently the highest um, kind of incidence level, um, but we also know it can be the hardest to identify. Um, and so that's kind of part of, um, again, those numbers about the kids we see don't line up with kind of the statistics about occurrence. Questions from the city? Yeah, here? I had a question about the um, the professional training. Yes. That you have. yes. I said, are some of those like, um, so being a Goldilocks yes. caregiver in a digital age, that also seems like something that would be helpful directly to parents. Yes. Are, are these like only within a training or are there downloadable resources or things that we could link from our school district website or um, how are these being shared or accessed? 
Yeah, great. So I think um, I would say linking to our website and our prevention and trainings page that we try and keep pretty updated. But I think also what we're finding is, um, you know, we we sometimes offer trainings that are just open to any community member, right? Folks can sign up and come. But we actually find, I think, that it becomes a lot more meaningful if we're coming to communities that already exist. Um, so we've really been enjoying like going to a PTA and providing that training or partnering with organizations that already have a community and network um, where everyone can get the same information at the same time and then integrate it into their community. Um, so folks can always also just reach out to that prevention at Children's Center email um, if folks are interested in accessing a training. Um, and I think you're exactly right that although it says professionals up there, a lot of these are appropriate for um, parents and caregivers as well. Would you want to add anything either? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Around the circle, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That works. Um, so at the beginning of every month, we get a report uh, from all of our department heads, including Chief Schmerber. Um, and I think it was one of my last meetings with Jackie. Um, we're seeing increased numbers as far as child abuse. And I'm curious if you guys are also experiencing that and thoughts as to why or patterns you're seeing. So, um, you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of this data lags. So you may be kind of the leading indicator. You know, for you, if you're not at a local, you know, within your own community, you might be getting that information even more than we are. As, as Orlando said, we are seeing the tip of the iceberg of kids that are experiencing this. So um, our numbers, you know, can fluctuate a little bit. Sometimes we're a little higher than... 500 or what have you, but we're only really being referred kind of a subset, often those kids where there's the most physical impact in addition to, uh, because there are requirements. Um, there's a lot called Carly's Law where any kid that's exhibiting a physical symptom needs to be referred in 48 hours to the organization like this, to the medical provider. So we're kind of seeing this subset and um, uh, generally speaking, what I understand about statistics are that um, neglect continues to increase over, it has been over time and lately, and that physical and sexual abuse um, are kind of steady, maybe even a slight dip in physical abuse that I've understood, like over a long time span. Um, but those obviously fluctuate kind of year to year for sure. and. Um, I know there were a lot of concerns. I'm sure you folks shared this um, during uh, the pandemic that there weren't eyes on kids and places for kids to, uh, people for kids to talk to and engage with. So I think we unfortunately, you know, did see kind of some increase in uh, disclosures post COVID. So is that same on target? Yeah. You see data as well. But yeah, no, I think that's fair. And I think we didn't maybe quite spell it out earlier, but we, all, we know that child abuse is underreported, yeah. right? So anytime we look at the number of referrals we get or a number of cases that get referred to, you know, child protective services, we have to remember that again, that's a, at the tip of the iceberg, like that's a subset of what is actually happening. I think anecdotally from like some of our clinical providers, I think there's a sense that we're seeing kids who maybe have um, more complicated kind of cases or more of those kind of multi, um, who've experienced like multi-victimization, who've experienced multiple kinds of abuse. So, and, and I think that point too, that, um, you know, it's hard to notice the like ebbs and flows as we experience them, but um, I bet in a few years, as we have a more robust picture of the data, maybe we'll have a better sense. And, and the one place that I will say, in I bet your law enforcement folks would back me up on this, is that the online exploitation and that leading to abuse and neglect, obviously that is ballooning and growing substantially. So that's one area where things are unfortunately <laughs> kind of raging out of control. So um, in that particular instance, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you all have a regional boundary to the populations that you serve? So we serve families in Clackamas County or who have a connection to Clackamas County. Um, and so most child advocacy centers um, operate kind of based on county levels, but um, of course there's some that serve multiple counties, some that just serve one county. 
Um, but yeah, kind of a connection to Clackamas County. We know that for some kids, maybe who have caregivers who live, you know, in different counties, um, that doesn't always have to be physically live here now, um, but that connection. And, and if you're uncertain, folks can always refer to us and our intake specialists can kind of parse that out if needed. Thank you. Yeah, I can go back to that. Yeah, come back around. Are you, are you under the umbrella of Trillium Family Services then or? No, no. Oh, I, I saw that saw, on the slide. So they are a sponsor for okay. our community conversations event. Yes. And I was just wondering, so does your group or anyone that you are, uh, that you work with, do they push for legislation at all? Because across the United States, there's a lot of really good legislation going on that is um, kind of putting a thumb down on top of uh kids getting online, registering on porn sites and things like that. And yeah. Oregon being a very liberal state, nobody wants to touch that. And, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, have you heard anything anywhere that somebody's actually willing to tackle that and start protecting the kids instead of protecting themselves? Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, and again, Justine talked about those three areas we're doing our work in prevention and that, uh, leading systems that heal and really thinking about that bigger picture, what are the policies that lead to healthy development relationships and in fact, safe environments. And that is exactly what you're speaking to. So we have started out conversations about that. When I talk about our prevention program growing, like that's kind of the next space we're hoping to move into more. We have a, a state association of all of the child advocacy centers in the state. And you can imagine that, uh, we will be more powerful together. So we're really working on building um, capacity in that regard to be tackling some of those really important issues. So I appreciate that so much. We, during Child Abuse Prevention Month, we had a community leaders breakfast. We invited a lot of elected leaders to join us and do a tour of the center. We're thinking next year about doing the day at the Capitol. So we're definitely, like we have to build some infrastructure around that and some energy around it, but I think I, um, and I'm not going to speak for a board member, Orlando can say um, what the appetite is there, but I, from our staff and from others that I interact with, there's a lot of energy around doing some of the work. Right. Glad to hear that. It should kind of be a no-brainer. I mean, when you, when you get a, when somebody, when another state has passed a piece of legislation that, uh, that just should be, copy it. Copy and paste, sign the dang thing. You know, it, it just should, to me, it, Oregon is lagging so far behind on legislation protecting our children from the internet. It's almost scary. Um, and it's too bad they can't do more. A lot of times, <laughs> right on, a lot of times, you're right on, but what we need is the force. And that's why we try to create these partnerships because a lot of times one or two people can go to the legislators in Salem say it really good but that's only one or two people when you when you bring a whole community a whole village there and and now those legislators are thinking votes oh i better listen look at all these people that's why partnerships and we're, we're the village but yeah. the impact legislation we got to do it together you're right on I want to ask a little bit about mandatory reporting we think of teachers and faith leaders and medical professionals as being in that role where they often, you know, can see the signs and, and have that requirement to report. Uh, it's been fairly recent, I think, that elected officials, all of us city councilors and school board members, are also now officially mandatory reporters. Uh, we haven't had a lot of direct uh, uh, training in what that means or what to do. But, you know, we like to be in that, if you see something, say something, role. And... Uh, should we be going to school officials if, if we perceive something on a playground or in a grocery store or something where we think there might be an issue? Do we go directly to law enforcement? Um, what guidance can you give us, in, in, in maybe in general terms, to be most effective and not overdo it, but not you know be so cautious that we don't act when we should? Um, well, I'll say first off, we would love to come and train your group of folks, and we do that in partnership with the Department of Human Services. Um, there is a statewide um, hotline for reports. That is what mandatory reporters are, are encouraged to do, is to call that hotline. 
Um, so when we talk about it, we don't discourage people from calling us and particularly if people are really not sure, our intake folks can talk to people on the line, but if if it's a case where there's there's a concern of abuse and neglect, we're going to encourage you to hang up and call the hotline. So uh, that's really the first place. And then, uh, and, and as uh, Justine referenced that training reporting, I do think that it's most effective. A lot of folks, I work for the state, we had to uh, had to do that training and, you know, news or boring 20 minute, you know, <laughs> online video. Doing it in person really does, um, I think add a lot of value our staff, DHS staff, can kind of address, you know, we can't obviously get into specific cases. We don't want to go there. But to just talk about what's what's best practice in terms of making that report, what happens after I make a report? A lot of people, especially educators who continue to have that relationship with that child and family, it's it's really difficult for them to make a call sometimes. And so how can they then also help to support that family afterwards? How can they make a call into the children's center and say, hey, I have to make this report, but I've got a family who's really struggling with X. And so we can maybe help to find some resources in that way or get folks connected. But I, I would really encourage you as a mandatory reporter, this, this training is really ideal in person and um, we are happy to do that in partnership with. And Mayor, one of the reasons we created that training is because we, we got that, we get that question a lot. Like, I know I'm a mandatory reporter, but I'm not sure. I, I'm kind of stuck. So we created that training. So it's really funny. And I think I'd say there's also just some good basics on, you know, if you just look up the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline, they have some good one and two pagers that just cover some of the basics. So that can be a good place to start as well. I have a quick question on that. How What's your classroom size that you normally like to see or and or not exceed so that you know what's comfortable for you i mean where can we if we decided to do something like that if we could pull together we can always invite other jurisdictions around us clackamas county is a very close group yeah. of people yeah. so what's what's your class size you like? yeah so um if, i would say it kind of depends on the training um stewards of children again is intended to also have kind of some um discussion um in in context. And so we tend to do 25-ish as a maximum for that. Again, that's the child sexual abuse curriculum. The mandatory reporting, we've done to some pretty big groups. We did um, talk um, ESD, um, some of their, like the early childhood providers, we had like 110 folks in the room. So some of those topics we can do to a bigger group for sure. And then, and, and we can adapt. I mean, there's some of those, um, trainings, the uh, digital safety and raising resilient kids. Justine and I just did with um, the Oregon PTA and we had nice small like under 20 groups and it's really nice if we can do some conversation and uh, discussion amongst that. But if if we've got a bigger group, we can adapt to that and, and just kind of share some resources that, that you know, we're pretty flexible. Other questions? Thank you all so much. Thank and for us. and Jennifer, you've got this with all the names, you've got the with all the emails and yeah. okay. Awesome. So okay. Is that from Jennifer and then we can get it there to you. I'll share it out. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. think I sent it to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can just, yeah. Um, but, Jennifer was very helpful in coordinating. Just want to recognize her. She yeah. <laughs> also want to say congratulations to Superintendent Bob. Yeah, I know. I know you're all in mourning, so, <laughs> um, but congratulations. I heard of the good things about you. Wish you well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, very, very much. And if you get the opportunity ever to go up, and yes. tour, it's We'd love yeah. to yeah. Yeah, it's, host an organized tour. Well, it's well tours, any time. Yeah. It's, it's same, same very email. Same email. Yeah. yeah. Anytime you want to do a tour. Thank you all Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you. Okay. See you well, soon. Thank you. Good, Good to see you. you. Stacy. Oh, okay. Stacy. Let's Stacy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, the room. I would have to like treat. <laughs> <laughs> I can go in a minute. It's okay. Thank you. I apologize for being. Oh, That's talking. all right.
Um, and thank you all for the great thing. It's just a, it's a wonderful organization. That's that's um, and once you see it, I went I went to their uh, like I said the, the breakfast um, with the stakeholders, and it's really impressive. It's really impressive what's being done. And we can never be over too over prepared when it comes to something. Like this. Um, and with that, we're going to go to least Chief Schmerber for um, the school resource. It says school resource officer. So I'll let you take it away. All right. Well, welcome. Um, great presentation by the Children's Center. We use them quite a bit, obviously, uh, in our line of work. So, um, but, uh, and they're very helpful because that's, that group there is, is, is um, required by state. They help us solve cases. They help us solve crimes. And so they're very, very interactive with law enforcement. And I appreciate that with the forensic uh, interview techniques. But uh, the purpose of, of, of us being here today is introduce you our school resource officer. He started with us in uh, February of this year um, and, and immediately hit the community running. Um, very grateful. Uh, Robbie Teague. Uh, who's sitting to my left here, he comes to us with a lot of experience, uh, six years in the Sheriff's uh, Office of Clackamas County uh, as a school resource officer at, at Rex Putnam. Um, we were able to steal him away uh, when he came back in, into law enforcement, stepped away from well for his job as a pastor and uh, apprentice and uh, electrician. Uh, electrical work, so I don't think that, that kind of puts feet to sleep a little bit. And we're trying to get uh, trying to get back into uh, law enforcement, and we're able to to uh, grab him, which was nice. He came to us. He's got kids going attend the Gladstone School District. He's very active in the community, as it has been for years, and um, he's a welcomed addition. And as as the schools have already experienced. With him being here, so I wanted to introduce you, Robbie T. Expect <laughs> Robbie to be here for, for quite a while. So, if you have any questions for Robbie, please, I uh, totally set him up. Questions <laughs> <laughs> for Robbie on, on this, um, or anybody wants to share experiences they currently have with school, would be great. Otherwise, uh, we thought it was a good idea to introduce you to Robbie. From the area, I am uh, very close, about seven minutes from the PD. Okay. My dad actually graduated from Gladstone. My mom graduated from Rex Putnam. So, we've been... so, so you grew up in North this, Yeah, I graduated from Putnam. My wife graduated. Did you from what am I student? Was I? <laughs> really, like my first year. <laughs> really? Yeah, your name was really familiar, and then I was like. Yeah, yeah. Was it my brother or anything? Maybe. What was your brother's name? Gary. No, I didn't. Back then. Was that? It was over about back then. Oh, back then. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. I will say I followed him in career day and it was very unfortunate. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let down with my presentation. <laughs> you had a backpack full of I know, that's trying to compete. <laughs> my favorite. I have a junior and a freshman. And I've done foster care. I've had eight kids uh, come stay with us. Uh, still in contact with uh, three, three of them. Um, Two of them we go over to Idaho to go see and stuff like that. So always just had a work for kids. Yeah. To have, you know, the support that they deserve. Chief, okay if I say a few things? Absolutely. Okay. Um so Robbie just mentioned his foster experience. That was one of the things that stood in the interview setting really stood out was uh his tenderness. For especially, I mean, we're talking about young, in many cases, very, very young uh, children that they've taken in and fostered and loved up uh, and returned in, to their families. And that was something that got to my heart right away uh, during the interview process. Uh, since we had Officer Teague on site, we, I don't know, I should have written down a list of, of the, the variety of people who have, apropos of nothing, come to me to talk about wow, we really found, we really found a great SRO. I mean, and, and often these comments are coming from staff who maybe are skeptical of what the police's role in our, in our schools are. 
uh, just inherently. And uh, Robbie's won a lot of hearts over in a very short period of time. And I'll just tell one, one really sweet, uh, he, you'll notice if you're here at lunchtime, Robbie's here or at one of the other schools, and he's always sitting with a different group of kids. He's always moving around the cafeteria, interacting, uh, handing out 37 stickers the other day. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at the high school in the mornings, uh, he's taken to occasionally working the front door with our with our counselor, Heidi Sauce, and there's they each occupy a door and they'll offer kids a choice. Uh, so one, one morning it was mountains or ocean, right? They're just really trying to entice the kids. And it has the impact of all it does is everybody who walks through the door is smiling one way or another. Uh, that's how they're starting their day. So thank you very much. It's, uh, it's fun, right? When you enjoy what you do, it makes it, it's not much more fun to do. So I enjoy being around kids. I think what we found when we brought Robbie into the organization is he has value. 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 In 2019, when I first met Bob, um, you know, I my philosophy was if our, if our schools and our kids are healthy, our community is going to be healthy. And that hasn't changed. Um, I think Bob can quote me on that or verify that. But and I believe that today, and, and Robbie has value. So, really appreciate it. Yes. Uh, one of the first days uh, when Officer Jake was outside the door of the elementary school, I was dropping off my grandson then. I ran into a parent outside who said, why are the police here? Is there something going on? Is there something danger in the community? <laughs> a lot of where parents' mindsets are these days. Uh, and so I think, the, and, and I think we're beyond that with a lot of our families now because you have been present at so many events and they understand part of it is just forming relationships and getting to know and having people familiar with you and comfortable with you and make yourself approachable. Um, but uh, it's all part of the same thing that Jeremiah referenced, uh, that that understanding among some in the community that, that the police and the school, whatever relationship they have, either comes out of a, you know, a bad situation, something going on, a dangerous thing, some some event that has to be responded to. And uh, it's nice that in this case, it becomes something that puts a smile on people's faces when they walk in the door and, um, uh, you know, makes them think, <laughs> maybe this is a career I'd like to pursue, or maybe this is, uh, you know, uh, somebody that, that can help me if I'm in the situation of those 160 perhaps kids in the, in the district. So, uh, it's a real positive thing for the community, and, and I, I am uh, appreciative of the, the joint decision that was made in, in hiring this officer to, to serve our community. Me too. <laughs> oh, well. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Mr. Mayor, you are up next. All right. Um. We've taken some action. Uh, one of our goals that we set at the first one of our first meetings as a city council in January a year ago was to form a youth council. We kind of adjusted the timing of when we'd implement it. Uh, Luke, are you prepared to to say a little bit about that? Because you were one of the ones that was kind of uh, <laughs> was that was that a, a, a shake of the head? No, uh, I, just a couple things. Nothing. Okay. All right. Well. Yeah, this is something that we've definitely kept the school board apprised of. You know, it's something that we've been very excited to keep moving forward. Last time it was an idea and today it exists. We have six applicants for our board. Uh, we'll be looking at interviewing them next Friday. I believe they all, uh, you know, they were very strong applicants with a broad range of interests. A lot of things that I wasn't expecting to see kind of in their outside of school extracurricular activities. So we're excited to be moving forward with that. We got a good report from Amy at the high school, letting us know that these are all you know strong applicants. So it's nothing short of what we're hoping for. We take questions, but we're, we're just very excited to be moving forward with this one. We, we realized going in that sometimes the students who are most involved in extracurricular things and sports and, and uh, you know, advanced academics may have the least amount of time to get to something like this. On the other hand, 
those are the type that have the self-discipline to really put themselves into even one more thing and and bring a lot to it uh, uh, and may eventually join the, the city council to to look at one an example of that type of person um, so uh, i've not seen the applicants myself i don't know uh, what they are uh, but uh, we were hoping for about seven we got to six uh, and we'll take questions from uh, from you if it, not about individuals in particular but out the, about the concept i'll add to that number two really quickly of six applicants relative to a city like oregon city where they have a you know considerably larger population and received i think it was around 14 or 15 applicants for their seven position council we received six. And so relative to a city that size, I think we did very well. Uh, look, I was gonna ask who breaks the tie? What's that? <laughs> who breaks the tie? We'll have to figure that one out. We're hoping everyone's on the same page, but we'll see what happens. Will they get a chance to interact with some of the other youth council? So like, you know. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Okay. It would be our ambition that we can send them to the youth summits that a lot of these other cities are taking place in. Uh, just as many opportunities as they can get. Uh, we'd like to introduce them to a lot of our city staff, uh, the individuals that kind of power a you know, municipal government, what it would take to get a closer look at those positions, how we run a city, sort of thing. We even received an application for the main grade. Oh, <laughs> that's exciting. Incoming freshman. Yeah, I, have, I do have a question. I'm curious how... Um, how the applications were accessed or distributed or what have you, obviously through the schools, but how were, did students just sort of self-select to fill it out or were specific students invited to fill it out or what was that process like? There was no specific student demographic targeted. It was just a general broadcast. We had uh, employees from the city come and speak at, was it a career day? Was yeah, that? Career day. Yeah, yeah, here at the high school where we were able to actually interact and speak with a number of them. Uh, but a lot of it ended up being word of mouth. Uh, Raymond was an excellent resource in, in uh, helping broadcast that even further. But a lot of them said, well, I heard about it from my other friend who applied and got it in that way. As this group is going, there's going to be more that want to be on it. So it's actually a really exciting time to start this last year. And as far as the schedule, <clears throat> we had hoped to make the selection prior to the end of this academic year, uh, but we'll have them uh, begin meeting maybe in, in August for some orientation and some sort of planning for the year. And then their year of service will be will coincide with the next school year. So we invited people that are currently eighth grade through currently 11th grade to participate because they will be high school age in the coming year. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, Raymond, once again, was uh, a very welcome presence at the grand opening of our new public works facility uh, last week, week before. Um, we've had several, uh, uh, you know, walkthroughs with the city council, but this was the first one that was for the community. And uh, even though it is a city building, it is what we call a, a, a critical facility. It's, uh, it's the place where, uh, because we have generators built in, uh, and staff who will handle uh, emergencies in a, a climate emergency or another kind of situation where uh, the public works who, who handle our roads and our uh, other kind of infrastructure will need to be involved. Uh, it's, it's of interest to everyone in the community, uh, not just the city, but the schools as well. So um, I think you have a flyer describing uh, that in your packet today. Um, and the great thing about this, <clears throat> well, a couple of things. First of all, there's a little box on the side that talks about the progressive design build, which was uh, the means by which uh, we have decided to uh, construct some of our key facilities here in the city. Uh, we've managed to do it within budget. 
on time. In this case, we finished a month early and we're under budget. Uh, and I know that as the district, and we'll talk about this soon, is looking at facilities too. You might want to consider this as a process. We, we're getting to the place where people from other cities are coming to us and saying, how'd that go for you? And we're giving them positive responses. Um, but uh, for many years, our public works department worked in really, um, what would we say? Inadequate. Inadequate. Okay. <laughs> Inadequate facilities. Um, and now there's an opportunity for them to meet with stakeholders in comfortable meeting spaces, to come in from a day's work when you're, uh, you know, working with asphalt and uh, the contents of sewer pipes and everything else, and come in and get cleaned off and get prepared to to head home. Uh, and it's got it's got showers, changing facilities, locker room, uh, and laundry. what's that? Laundry. Laundry in there. Yeah, all of that. So uh, a lot of maybe what was missing before. Uh, we did a we did the careful kind of process and preparation that you all are doing for your facilities to say what was really needed, what was missing, what can we provide? And we did it by converting a building that uh, had sort of a basic metal structure. Uh, and we were able to, uh, because our budget was limited because of the high cost these days of doing construction, uh, we were able to convert an existing facility into a place that looks like a brand new build, but really wasn't. Uh, and uh, that was part of the reason why we did it under budget and uh, on time. Uh, it was also uh, a, a wonderfully entertaining pro project for families in the community. I would walk by at least once a week and often saw people with kids in strollers. Uh, so, you know, that all, that always <laughs> appeals. Those of you with very young children know how appealing that is to a community. Uh, any questions? I just want to say too that it, it's it's inviting to the to the public now, where before it was a little scary to go into anybody <laughs> inside that gate. Now it's open to the public and people can walk inside. There's somebody there to greet you. It, it's a, a much nicer and warmer feeling for our city. I was going to ask, so it's on. It's because I don't even remember a building there, honestly. So. <laughs> And because I, I was like, wow, where's the old one? And now you just said that it's it was there. And it's it's like they peeled off the outside, was basically sheet metal. Yeah. And then there there's the there this new um uh, I forget what they call it, but this kind of surface that you can put on a building where the insulation is built in, the, the surface on the inside is conducive to the interior of a building, the surface on the outside is weatherproof and conducive to the exterior of the building. It goes up quickly. Uh, you know, once the outside walls were down, they put a concrete slab down. They carved the areas into where the walls were going to be, and it just went up like, you know, like Legos. Uh, it, it's just amazing how how, how it was done. So uh, it's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. I think it's still you. <laughs> All right, we'll give you an update on uh, the Gladstone Library. Uh, Jackie Betts, our city administrator, has met with uh, some of the library uh, staff and got, and county people and has a report for us on, on where we are with that. Yeah, so it's very exciting times. Clackamas County, who operates the library, uh, invited me to the rest of their meetings to start planning for the grand opening. They're going to take temporary occupancy in August, mid-August. What that means is that they're going to shut down the current library to allow a transition time. And they're saying that that could be between three to five weeks. They're not expecting it to go that long, but that will give them time to move into the new library. Uh, they're planning to open up the first part of September to the public with the grand opening probably later in September. Uh, one of the amenities that they're very excited about is that they're incorporating what are called library lockers. Um, so that if you want, it's like Amazon, if you want to buy something and go pick it up in a locker, you can do it after hours. Um, 
and you just check it out online and have that accessibility there. And it will really help the library director to gauge high traffic time so that when she's uh, planning for what time of the week that the library should be open, it gives her an idea of when that should be. So I'm sure all of you have seen it. It's looking amazing. They are on target to open up, like I said, probably the first part of September. So it's very exciting. Obviously, the proximity to the elementary school is one great feature. Uh, we're already using the library on Wednesday afternoons for a great uh, uh, snack and steam program that is uh, involving a lot of families from the school. I see them walking over directly and, uh, you know, coming away really happy. So it's one of those collaborative things that uh, uh, it, it just makes Gladstone a great place to live and to raise children. Uh, because of the way that the, the staff, you know, they, they, they share the needs and find a way to come up with a new way to serve the community and to address uh, families' needs for after-school activities, for extra learning opportunities. And uh, we've always had our librarians involved in the, in the community. I say our librarians. They were city staff up until the end of 2019. Now they're technically county staff. Uh, and, uh, but... They're still ours. Uh, they serve this community. I want to echo how great the snack and steam. We were there today. We've been there for several weeks for our families, and it's just hopping. I mean, with there's a lot of a lot of kids having a really great time. So that's been a wonderful program. And I know that that's on Education Foundation was also involved in helping I think fund some of the um, materials and snacks for some of that. So that's, it's been great. That program, actually, they brought in a new librarian and she just she began that program and it's been so popular. They have moved people around so that she could get additional help in order to help, you know, make sure that every family that comes in on Wednesdays and they are re-gearing for the, you know, September once school closes and comes back around to have that as a as an even bigger priority because it, it just serves a need. Um, that empty Wednesday afternoon thing. It just serves a big need. So I'm really excited for it. And, and I don't know how many of you were involved, but um, you know, it's been now, let's see, it was late 2018 that we first appointed the committee that would help you know, determine the values and, and begin the process of designing a library for this community and the shared branch in the Oak Lodge community. Um, and Part of that has been listening to the community of what they wanted a library to be and trying to design it accordingly. And uh, it's very gratifying for me to hear from children at the elementary school level who are saying, I can't wait for that library to open. It's so great that it's so close to the center of everything in the community. And I'm really looking forward to the puppet theater or you know, the, the outdoor garden or some of the other parts. Uh, when you when you do that with that kind of community engagement, and then people say, what I wanted is what's going to be there, uh, then it just builds up that anticipation for an opening. So uh, I know it will be a very popular place. Um, it won't be as big as some of the Clackamas Library branches in other cities, uh, but I think it will be adequate to serve our community. And uh, because of the way it's designed and because of the set, some of the technology that's involved, as Jackie alluded to, it'll give us, give the library staff the ability to adjust hours in a way that, that meets the needs of more families uh, based on the demand and the times uh, that they really want to be there. Okay, we'll, we'll try to see that happen. Great. I wanted to add that we don't know what we're going to do with the old library site yet. Uh, we do get a lot of questions about that. The city owns the property and the building. In 2025, the council will have to make some decisions, but we'll have to go in and have an assessment made of the building to determine whether or not it can be reused or if there's just too much remediation that it's best to try to sell it. So I look for that to be on the, the council's agenda in 2025 to decide what to do with the old site. Thank you. Um, so we are now to agenda item number seven um, with the new superintendent introduction. Is this you, Bob? Yep. Okay, be glad to. <clears throat> 
So you all know Jeremiah. So this isn't really an introduction where you don't know who he is, but uh, just a little bit about him. Um, Jeremiah lives in Wilsonville. Um, uh, married, two kids. Oldest is a junior in high school. So they've been doing the college tours this year, looking at the possibilities where Will might head off to college next year or a year from now. And um, uh, he is an educator that uh, uh, has worked for Gladstone on two different occasions. The first was from 2006 to 2008. Um, he originally applied to be the principal of John Wetton Elementary School in 2006 and figured out at the time that the principal was probably in the same interview as he was that was going to get hired. And so he quickly pivoted and decided, you know, maybe that assistant principal job would be a pretty good job at John White Elementary School. So he joined us for two years at the time. Um, I strongly tried to discourage him from leaving, but he decided he was going to leave to become principal of uh, Riverdale School in Portland, where he was for four years. Uh, following that stint, he went to Sherwood School and was a principal of an elementary school at that time. In 2016, um, several of you will remember uh, Pia Leonard served in the role of uh, assistant superintendent at that time. And she, um, she, we knew she was on a path to retire for quite a while because she had announced that that would be her final year, 15, 16 school year would be her final year. So we started a search in the springtime uh, with the idea that the possibility that whoever retired could potentially be the successor um, to, to me in that job. And um, uh, finishing that process, Jeremiah was the winner. And it was brought on board in uh, the fall of 2016. And um, I think he thought I was going to be here for about two years. It turned out to be a smidge longer than that. Um, <laughs> there just were interesting opportunities that came up that I didn't want to walk away from quite yet. And uh, uh, so he has been with Gladstone now for 10 total years. Um, this is his eighth in this job. And uh, that's twice as long as he stayed anywhere else in any of the jobs that he's had. And it was it was interesting the other night, there was a there was a nice function for me at a retirement function. And um, Joe Gafari, who was superintendent here in the 1980s was there. And um, I had a chance to visit with Joe afterwards. And he's, he's, he came to Gladstone, I believe it was in 1973, was assistant superintendent for nine years. <laughs> superintendent in 1982 to 1991. So he had an 18-year run. And he said, you know, it was never my intention to go to Gladstone and only stay and go for longer than two years. My plan was two years and I would move on. But he said, there's just something about Gladstone that once you get there, you don't want to leave again. And that's generally what I tell people when they're tired. There's, there's something special about this place. And, um, and Jeremiah's found that out. And he found out that this is going to be a pretty good home. He will be an outstanding super, outstanding super. I have no doubts about that. He will lead the school district in a direction that will be incredibly positive. And uh, within uh, about 24 hours, you'll say, Bob, who? <laughs> <laughs> um, so welcome aboard, Jeremiah. I'm happy for you. I'm happy for the community. I, I shared the other night that I thought the board made an outstanding uh, decision when they made the decision. Um, I was careful how soon I would say that um, in the whole process, but I didn't want them to think I was trying to send them a direction. But, uh, they made that decision on their own and it was the right decision. So anyway, welcome aboard, Jeremiah. Um, I didn't bring my yellow glasses, but <laughs> it was such a good speech though. <laughs> Um, I don't know what to say exactly, but I, 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 one of the things I brought into my interview was this transition plan. I, I haven't recycled it yet because it cost me too much money <laughs> <laughs> at Office Depot. I practically printed on cardboard. <laughs> it's nice cardstock. It's nice cardstock. It's like, this is the thickest, fanciest paper you've got. Uh, but I thought I'd just like kind of share what the, what the way I envisioned that transition and, and maybe how that's actually going. Uh, it had four goals. The first was to deepen the relationships with the, with the board and start to uh, start to reframe the relationship a little bit. And, um, you know, I intended for, for the first and second goals to run from April through June. So uh, as we're putting the school year 
uh, closer to bed. Um, we have some opportunities, some pretty heavy, uh, some weighty topics to, to, to convene and talk about that's providing lots of opportunity. And Bob's been really gracious about inviting me into one-on-ones. Uh, and I really am enjoying that. Second is to provide continuity for the long range facilities planning committee um, that, that I've been uh, helping to facilitate for a while. And I think I get to share about that a little bit later. Uh, and then there's just a deep, deep engagement really in September. Um, deep uh, engagement with all of our different constituencies. So there will need to be, uh, per the state, there will need to be another round of, of deep engagement around the Student Success Act. And that's a really nice opportunity to uh, to get out amongst the community and, and listen with different ears. And Bob warned me of this, but he said, you know, pretty quick, you won't be, you walk into a room and you won't be good old Bob anymore. Somebody's gonna have an agenda. Uh, and that's fine. That's good. Uh, I just need to I just need to be mindful of that and uh, self aware. And then uh, really want to launch the year strongly with a, a very intentional communications plan. So I've been talking to some staff who have communications backgrounds and communications expertise. Uh, been talking with uh, other superintendents, especially folks who came up internally uh, within their own organization. And uh, I'll be excited to share uh, that with the school board in uh, July. And then if y'all would like to take a peek at it, uh, love your uh, input on it as well. Um, you may have seen, I want to just highlight one connection with the city while I have the floor. Uh, you may have seen an Oregon, uh, Oregon Live article a couple of weeks ago now that uh, came out. That same author was wrote the doom and gloom article back in October, November about ain't things awful in the state of Oregon. And the, the truth is school attendance has been brutal. And, and Oregon was one of the few states that, that took a step backwards last year as opposed to forward. Um, but in that first article, it, it kind of barely mentioned that Gladstone, Banks, and Park Rose were the only three school districts that made any progress at all, just a little bit. Uh, it was 1.4%. And I round that up to two. <laughs> We're going in rounds and down to one. <laughs> uh, but I, I got a chance to come and present to you in the fall about Gladstone Shows Up, really a homegrown marketing campaign, uh, and it worked. And so that's why the Oregon Oregonian wanted to come out and talk. Of course, they wanted to come out and make it into a kindergarten story. <laughs> um, and I I gave it my best shot to say this is a community story. This is a city city story. We were a little bit more successful when two days later KGW wanted to come out and uh, basically do the same story, uh, but televised. And uh, an hour before, I was panicking and I texted Jackie and said, "Please tell me the mayor's going to be there." <laughs> uh, I realized that I need media training, not not just by fire. And I think I'm going to take it from Mr. Milch, Mayor Milch. Uh, he and a couple of our staff members. Uh, we're a lot more comfortable and a lot more uh, loquacious in front of the camera. I took the advice of Ben Bowman, uh, who works for us, and, and his advice was, you don't have to fill the space. Like, just, just say what you want to say, and that's enough. So that's why I got one little pithy comment in there. <laughs> that was it. Um, but I just, I just, it's been a very successful effort. And, um, you know, it, it truly has not been a... Um, there's, there's no secret to it, except for being really disciplined about meeting together around data as a data, data team and being really uh, clear with the community about why this is so important and, and helping the community understand this is a social problem, not a school problem. Um, this is about mental health, it's about wellness. And I think that's been, I think that's the reason it's been successful because so many folks in the city, business owners, uh, churches, uh, you all have embraced it as it, and, uh, we're busy uh, cooking up Gladstone shows up 2.0. Uh, that'll so in order to do that, we've got to declutter the city. So tomorrow we're actually going around Get signs up, take them all down. Uh, one's out front. Like I have a question: if that whether or not that's legal to step onto somebody's property with the you sign that I gave them, is it like? Onto my property. Oh, thank you. you got permission. You can advise me after. There you go. Um, and we'll launch that in a, in a kind of a similar fashion. You guys will all be invited. Our welcome, district welcome back will be the morning of August 27th. 
uh, it'd be here at the high school and I'll give you a, a specific times, but you know, you'll know it's in the morning and you're always welcome to come join us. We'd love to have as many of you as would be our honored guests. But thank you all. And thanks. I appreciate it. I appreciate the assist. I'll, I'll say two things. When we have temporary signs up for elections, our public works department goes out, picks up signs that are still in, in areas, brings them to a facility and candidates and get them back. So there is precedent for removing signs, uh, you know, when it's appropriate to do so. Uh, so uh, you are welcome to, uh, you know, and I'll, whether individual people will be upset with you, you might put the word out before you have to let them know. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's my purpose program. I have a whole bunch of my school candidate ones in our backyard. As far as dealing with the media, the other thing we learned, is you, you said they wanted to make it a kindergarten story because that was where they focused uh, in the Oregonian too. They took 33 minutes of video with, uh, you know, a mayor, uh, uh, an administrator to be, uh, I mean, a superintendent to be and, and a staff member uh, articulating in great detail why this program has worked so well. Um, but it happened to be on the day that they were serving Roadrunner pizza in the <laughs> kindergarten cafeteria. And once those kids came in and started eating, the, the camera guy was, <laughs> one, that was the footage that you saw <laughs> on the news. You know, our words, yeah, a pithy one sentence, you know, chopped up and combined, uh, you know, is what gets out there. So if you ever do media interviews with the television news, don't expect to get a, more than a full sentence uh, on the air. Uh, be happy with what you get. And uh, our kindergarten children looked as happy and well-adjusted and uh, well-fed as they could be. And that was a good part of the story. Uh, uh, we made, as you learned earlier, we made a real good, district made a real good decision this year as far as uh, food services and uh, menus, and it continues to be a very popular thing. I have this one, just a weird, just curiosity thing. Sure, what Bob said, what's what's your commute like in the morning at home? To here? Yeah. yeah. Wilson, I live in Wilsonville, so oh, I, I thought you said Sherwood. I commute oh, to Sherwood. Okay. Yeah, I go about 25 minutes. 25, oh, that's not bad then, okay. <laughs> Longer in the afternoon. I'm guessing it's like maybe someday it's 25 and someday it's almost an hour. Is it that uh, morning's predictable afternoon? So. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, like today. Um, I have a quick question. So I just in talking with other community members, people uh, and they had heard that the enrollment was down at the school after uh, the kids had come back from, you know, uh, the break at COVID break. I'm not sure what you'd want to call it, but. And they kind of speculated, well, how many of those kids, their folks decided that maybe homeschooling wasn't so bad after all, and that's what they decided to continue doing, which is, I have no judgment, no judgment at all. But have, did you find that at all, that people called and said, hey, you know, we're just going to stay at home another year or two. This is all good. Uh, a small, a small group. Okay. The, 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 okay. Enrollment, the enrollment declined, our theory which we believe is is based in in reality uh -huh. is it's ha has to do with housing, okay, housing prices, uh, the, the difficulty to afford a home at Gladstone, because we are you know have remained about thirty percent of our students come to us from other school districts and find a way to transfer in and get in here, right, and that number has stayed static, while the the uh, resident enrollment has gone down, uh, as as it's seen. And hasn't the birth rate down, yeah. gone down as well? Ten percent. Birth rate's state, down ten percent. Right? The whole state, not just. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Soon the school board will get to see a demographic study. Well, thank you for that information. Yeah. So we're on agenda item number eight, which is the school district about the free breakfast and lunch for all, which is exciting news. I know. Yeah. Um, so Michael, you're right. Um, service program has really stepped up this year. Uh, we were very fortunate last year, our, our um, coordinator and director of our food service program was open. It uh, was also the previous year, we had difficulty filling. It was really very, very difficult. This year, we happened to have a guy that uh, had been the director of the food service program in Sayusla School District, which is in Florence, Oregon. And uh, he wanted to move to the metro area. We happened to have the job open at the right time. Uh, he jumped in and we said, yes. Uh, he's known as Chef Dave. 
Dave. Chef Dave. So if you hear kids talk about Chef Dave, that's who they're talking about. The guy that's in charge of the food service program. And there have been many um, really nice improvements that have happened. Participation has grown during the course of the year. Um, and one thing that he brought to us was um, a strong interest in attempting to qualify for federal programs that could provide food uh, for more kids. And uh, there's a there's a program called, I have to always have to look at the names, Community Elig Eligibility Provision. Those are three words I put together very often. Um, but that's, uh, that's the name of the program. And essentially, if you have reached a certain threshold of percentage of students that qualify under the federal standards, and these are not the federal standards. These are more stringent. So these are families that are on app or TANF. Um, it's kids that are in foster care. It's families that are homeless. And that's what you count as part of your, your count. And um, uh, through a lot of work of doing actual interviews with some families, we learned that uh, more than 40% of our kindergarten through fifth grade children qualified for that program. And that was the threshold. 40% was the threshold. Once you reach the threshold, then you qualify for free lunch, pro free breakfast and lunch program for all kids um, from that date that you qualify for four years forward, regardless of what your enrollment looks like for those four years, but you're qualified for four continuous years. So in, in April, uh, we launched it with um, uh, kindergarten and, and first through fifth. What we found is that um, just in that one month, our participation in the, the hot lunch program, so that's the program that's free, uh, in, increased by 10% in just that one month. We know that that's gonna jump up even more. So they went to work on middle school and high school. And right now we're in the final stages that we know that we qualify. We have to get the sign-offs yet from the state that we've qualified. Once we get the sign-offs, then that program will launch next fall. So beginning next fall, every student in Gladstone School District will have free breakfast and lunch if they choose. Isn't that great? That is just great. So anyway, um, uh, Jennifer has, uh, uh, Rachel um, Hopper, our, our CFO for the school district, put together a nice sheet that kind of describes the program in a lot of detail. And um, Jennifer will send that to, to your folks, Jackie, and you can distribute it to the council. We also need to get it against the board because they don't have this level of detail either. Um, to just share, share with you, if you're, if you're interested in reading the two pages, uh, I think you'll find it interesting on in what that looks like. But um, so it's a great opportunity for our kids. We know, we know when kids are fed, they're going to do better in school. Absolutely. When they're fed, they're going to do better in school. So we're going to have that opportunity. Yeah. And they're more inclined to be there. Yep. yep. Bob, is the summer food program affiliated with that or is that a separate? It's not affiliated with this. Okay. But it's a separate program that's free, and um, and that'll launch. I don't remember the dates, but that'll launch the, over the summer and run. I think probably for eight weeks. Okay, and those are going to be at near at parks at or near center. Dave, Dave has all kinds of ideas where yeah. he wants to go. Chef Dave. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, previously we we did all this at the Gladstone Center for Children and Families, and we sack lunched up to some kids that were <laughs> middle school. Um, but now he's he's got different tips he wants to put up around town to attract kids uh, closer to where they live. So it's all good stuff. So you'll have uh, some, you will have summer school this year at all the schools, no. or I know that there, the funding isn't there. Yeah, middle school, so, just the middle school. Say that again. Just the middle school. Okay, so just middle school for middle school age kids or at the middle school for everyone? The former. So okay. so uh, <laughs> rising, rising sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders. And that's because of a grant that uh, we received a couple of years ago. It's continuing. Okay. Uh, the other, the, we were 144th on a, on a list where the, the ordered list where 77 were, were uh, funded. Yeah, yeah, would have been nice. And you feed the kids at summer school then? Oh, yeah. yeah. To all of them all like of them. this yep. and that and this program that uh yeah. mr seward's talking we'll give, we'll give you the full list okay. of where we're going to have food at this summer oh okay and, that's, and that's something part you'll probably that. want to publish okay. jackie in your newsletter but that's um, not only for students in summer school it's no, for anybody and they don't even have to be okay. a gladstone okay. student it's just very yeah. yeah. oh who's, good. and <laughs> that's i'm pretty confident when i tell you this that, that it, there's no requirement eligibility requirement for free lunch in the summer for all kids. 
Bob, do you know how you, you talk about that 40% threshold that enable us to get into this program? How many of the other districts in this region meet that same threshold? Uh, the, the Oregonian article made it sound like we were comparatively more wealthy than some of the Portland districts, obviously, and they have a bigger problem with attendance there than we do. But where do we fit in into the bigger scheme? Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know the, where we fit in the bigger scheme. This criteria is different, though, than what you hear reported. What you hear reported has to do with the free um, and reduced funding yes. program. And so that's, that's a different criteria, okay. different eligibility for that. And um, communities have changed a lot in the last few years. And that includes Portland. As gentrification has hit, communities are not as poor as they used to be that used to be really poor because housing costs have driven out the poor. Uh, that's the reality. Um, and the data has not caught up with that yet. Are there metrics from other school districts that have implemented this leading to a correlation and uh, increasing attendance? Look it up. I don't know it off the top of my head, but let's see. I think it's hard to tell. I mean, <clears throat> I can't. Our school's been free and reduced lunch for a lot of years. So it happened before. So there, there's not a wait. Like, I think you have to have it's it happen. Yeah, the on switch was a long time ago, so we still we're still struggling with attendance. But if you so it's unique that it's happening at the same time we're trying to improve attendance, and then we can see if like it is you know oh. we're yeah, yeah yeah, um, but I I I wonder like elementary it, they're probably. I wonder if it, you'll see it at middle and high more. That was my guess. Those because, kids are going to be there because that's where their parents put up. Their yeah, whereas school. middle and high, if I am going to be able to go eat, I'm more probably likely to show up versus if I don't have food to bring and I don't have money, then I don't want to show up yeah. because I don't have a way to get any food, right? Or I'm going to leave to go get food and then I'm not coming back. <laughs> or, or maybe the stigma of a free and reduced lunch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just like to erasing that, that I, I- Now that it's everybody, it's, yeah. There is no stigma. All right, moving on to agenda item number nine, which is also the school district, the long range facility planning. Sweet. So I'm gonna share with you just a little bit about where we are in process with our facilities. Uh, facilities process, um, facilities planning process. So this is a plan to develop, this is a plan to develop a plan uh, for 10 years of what, what our facilities needs are. Uh, and there've been several steps along the way. The first thing we did was bring in uh, uh, professionals over the summertime last year to come take stock of everything. So just a, just a state of play report on what's going on, what's going well, what needs, what the lifespan of any given system or roof or uh, classroom technology is. And so uh, the architects that we uh, have engaged with, a company called Brick, they, they created, this is the very skinny version, so it's a, it's a big, thick uh, report. And it's just that. It's not, it has nothing to do with, it's nothing aspirational. It's simply what taking stock and measuring exactly what it is that you have so that the district then can evaluate uh, and start to later on put things in order of priority, right? The next thing that we did was, uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the technical component of it. The really adaptive component of it is something that many of you will be, have, were participants in, right? So uh, uh, Council Member Don Donington was involved in, uh, also, Huckabee was there as well when we, when we came to the city and did a, a kind of a city listening session. But there were listening sessions. There were 11 of them that happened at all, mostly with students and families representing uh, groups that don't often get represented or get underrepresented in a process like this. So focal populations, uh, including students at our schools, to get some perspective on with some prompts. Uh, how's the school serving you and, and how's the school not serving? And um, so we, we appreciated the opportunity to do that with the, the city group as well. I thought I'd just read for you a few of the, they bulleted out the takeaways and here are a couple of them. There, there are two slides worth, I'm not gonna read them all, but 
Uh, recognition of the district's efforts to promote diversity and inclusion, but also highlighting areas for improvement, such as need for better staff representation, multilingual signage, artwork and displays, gender neutral restrooms, et cetera. Uh, identify barriers to student success, including housing insecurity, food insecurity, language barriers, transportation. Community schools needed in school to foster connection uh, and also as a way that the school can be used in a setting like this when school is not in session. Uh, need to create bridges for neurodivergent students to connect with neurotypical peers. So infor informal spaces, standard club options, that kind of a thing. So I, I can I can read them all to you, but it, it would be happy to send you a couple of slides. But you get a flavor for uh, the kind of information gleaned from those meetings. Uh, the next step was to form an actual committee. And so the Long Range Facilities Planning Committee has some people who are involved in that. It has some staff, it has some community members, and it's about 35 people who are getting together at four sessions, about two and a half hours long. We are halfway there. So we've had the first two sessions, we're having one at each school site. And uh, that is a, that's a process. So we always start with a tour so folks can kind of see what, you know, a space like now, you're getting to see the theater, maybe in a different way if you've come from for a musical or something, maybe you've never seen around the corner of the curtain before. <laughs> uh, so we do a tour and then we do some processing and, and the processing has led us to a place where, where we've gotten to uh, the creation of priorities by which all of the projects suggested in the report can then be put into some order. And so the second at the second meeting, uh, we arrived at what those what those priorities are. Uh, they are improved learning environments. So improvements directly impact the quality of education, such as updated classrooms, technology infrastructure, and resources that support teaching and learning, outdoor education, recreation. Safety and belonging addresses all potential security concerns, also addresses emotional and physical safety. Uh, that came up in our city in meeting for sure. Future ready spaces, ensuring that school facilities are equipped with up-to-date technology, infrastructure, equipment, uh, and adaptable to evolving educational needs. Infrastructure and maintenance. Maintenance needs and infrastructure improvements to ensure the longevity of facilities. I think about the work that you all just completed and you're creating a, a city works environment that's gonna be here and be ready for 50 more years. Uh, equity and inclusion, equitable access to educational resources and opportunities to center those most impacted by inequity. And finally, I, th and I think this last one's gra great that, that folks didn't forget this. Uh, functional outdoor environments. Ensure school sites are fully functional as learning and recreational resources. So the, the perfect example of this is the, is the track at the stadium that gets used all the time. There's always a community member walking the track. At night, the soccer leagues come in, they provide, they, they provide rental fees. That is, that is a truly sustainable resource because it, it actually sustained its own replacement. When the turf was ready to be replaced. It was the rentals for that facility that allowed. Uh, so like spreading that notion, um, I don't know what that will mean uh, over time, but that as a priority is uh, being included. I was really excited about that because it speaks to the fact that the school is the community's uh, most valuable asset. L literally the school properties are, are incredibly valuable assets in the community. And if the schools are, Functioning well, that, that relates to the property value of all the all of the um, folks who live in the city and their quality of life. So um, later on, uh, the the next two meetings are May twenty eighth at Cracksburger, and then June eleventh at John Wed. And that's where the meat and potatoes is going to happen. Those five hours are going to be pretty pretty action packed, and a lot of the kind of norming and forming is done. Now it's time to storm, I suppose. And then there will be a report to the school board uh, this summer. I'm not sure if it's going to be July or August. Uh, school board will be getting that report in full at that time. Been a fun pro process to, uh, I have not been, in pro I got to, my first ever taste of a process like this was when we built uh, 
the center and and did all of this back in my first tour of duty. So uh, it's been a really been a, it's a passion of mine and it, it, it's very uh, invigorating. So. Thanks, Jeremiah. All right, and Mr. Mayor, you are our last agenda item, which is the affordable housing in Gladstone. Well, we've already alluded to the fact that uh, low enrollment uh, and a decline in enrollment in schools, which is happening across the state, <clears throat> a lot of people attribute that to changes in demographics. People are getting married later. They're postponing having families uh, if they have them at all, or they have smaller families. And, uh, and we're not seeing uh, the same growth in family size or in uh, school age enrollment that we used to. But at local levels, we also know that one component of uh, lower enrollment in schools is the ability for families with school age children to afford to live in the community. And we were required, uh, it's six years ago now, to, to begin a, a housing needs analysis in our community and look at how many families are paying more than you know a certain threshold of their income on housing and found that Gladstone is one of the most severely rent burdened communities in Clackamas County or in the state because uh, our, uh, it, it costs more to live here in proportion to what people make who, who live here and work here. Um, and Superintendent Stewart was in attendance in that meeting talking about decline in, enroll in enrollment and it had been going on for a couple of years already. This was back at the end of 2018. Um, well, that pattern has continued. And um, so a couple of things are going on. We built an affordable housing project here in Gladstone a couple of years ago, but it serves people who are 50 and older. So it's not something that contributed to uh, better enrollment in the school district. Uh, we constructed uh, or a, a large apartment complex was constructed in this community uh, before that. And at the time, we said, well, two bedroom apartments, three bedroom apartments, we're going to have some young families in there. And at the school district, you did a projection on enrollment. You thought, what, do you get 60 kids out of that? About 80. About 80 kids out of that. And it turned out to be, what, a handful? Five. Okay. <laughs> Five new kids to Gladstone out of 124 units. So, uh, so I don't want to get you too uh, excited about, you know, the prospect for the school district. But one of the things that happened recently is that uh, partly because of interest at the local level and partly because of uh, mandates coming down from the state level, from the legislature, cities have made changes in some of their zoning rules. And in Oregon, Oregon was one of the first states that statewide required cities of a certain size to uh, no longer be allowed to have single family uh, zoning areas limited to just that type of detached single family homes. And the, the move was made to add middle housing types as something that has to be required in most of our uh, formerly single household home uh, neighborhoods. So our 7.2 zone, which is the homes in the ridge area of the community, and the 5.0 zone, which is the homes in the flat area of the community, 5,000 square foot lots, 7,200 square foot lots. All those zones now um, are allowed to have, uh, to, to modify their properties for middle housing, which is duplexes, triplexes, up to fourplexes, or cottage clusters around a central common area. Uh, the kinds of housing that used to exist in communities decades ago, but sort of went away as, as the suburbs developed and, and people wanted the bigger homes. Uh, we saw shifts around in the type of homes that people wanted to live in during the pandemic. As people started working more from home, uh, there was greater demand for some of the larger single family homes and we saw move, people moving into those. And of course the prices went up. But what's happening now, after having made those zoning changes, uh, we're beginning to see uh, at a higher level than we ever have in the past, people coming to our local planning department and making pre-application for uh, considering uh, changing a piece of property, 
that was a single family home at one time to something that may be a duplex or a triplex or adding an accessory dwelling unit. Um, uh, an example I can point to that maybe some of you in the school district are familiar with is this sort of kitty corner to the elementary school on Exeter Street between the fire station and the elementary school is a lot that was about a, I think it was about a 7,000 square foot lot that had a small 1,000 square foot home on it uh, about uh, six years ago. And there was a man, an elderly man looking for a home in Gladstone and what he decided to do was buy that thousand square foot home, tear it down and put up a triplex that had two two story units and one one story unit that this man could live in because he needed a home that was more universal to design and accessible for his needs. And having the two other units on the property enabled him to rent those units and afford the mortgage and the, and the construction cost of the whole thing. This was before the state put in these middle housing rules, but it was a real good example of a property that got redeveloped in a way that worked for the owner of it and also provided potential housing for somebody right in a school neighborhood and near the downtown area. And we're starting to see other people uh, make application for those kinds of uh, properties. And I think you've been given a list of some of them. Uh, this is a list of, of the, the contacts that come to our planning department. Sometimes somebody will propose something and they'll say, gee, I'd like to put three units on this. And they say, well, the way you've got it laid out, you know, you're not meeting the setback requirements. You're a little too close to your neighbor. Work on it, come back to us. And then they do. And our planning department works very well with people to make sure that what they come up with is something that will work. Um, some people are tearing down a garage and saying, I, in the space where the garage was, I can put a two-story, two-apartment thing that will make a triplex out of my out of my uh, property. Now, again, uh, I'll, I'll throw out the caveat. You, you look at the example of the Webster Ridge Apartments. This may not mean huge change in, in affordable homes for young families in the community, but it has the potential to do so. And as we, we're just beginning to see these things coming in, if some of them are designed very well and they really uh, meet the needs of the neighborhoods and of the families, uh, we're hoping it will stimulate others of the same type to go in in this community. Another thing that's happened you may have read about is that the legislature recently passed something called climate friendly and equitable communities. Um, and that means that there are areas in our community where we've had to make certain changes to comply with efforts to uh, make the city less um, uh, less reliant on automobiles. Uh, and one of the one of the rules was that if you are within a half a mile of a uh, frequent rate public transit area, you have to remove all parking minimums from construction requirements. Now, because McLaughlin Boulevard has the 33 bus that goes every 15 minutes, that's a frequent service public transit. Everything a half a mile on either side of McLaughlin, which on the west side takes you to the river, and on the east side takes you to about the elementary school, uh, we no longer have parking minimum requirements for those for that area. So that has stimulated development of properties that had sat vacant for years. Uh, you all know Terry Marsh from your uh, uh, Education Foundation. His family owned a piece of property at the foot of uh, Portland Avenue that sat unused. It had been years ago uh, a meat market. Uh, and then uh, uh, Terry's dad had plans for maybe developing a mixed use uh, uh, building with commercial on the ground floor <laughs> and housing up above, but the parking requirements made that a project that, that wouldn't pencil in at all. You'd have to put so much parking there to cover the number of units in the building that you couldn't make money on. Now, those requirements are gone and that property recently sold and some kind of development will be happening there as well as on some other properties uh, on that west side of Gladstone. 
Uh, the same rules don't apply to the properties on the east side, uh, you know, down by Safeway and up the ridge. But um, we do hope that we will see uh, more development, uh, both for the sake of adding more housing here in Gladstone and uh, economic development and improvement of destinations in the community, uh, the places where people want to go. Uh, things that are in close proximity to one another so that people are less reliant on their automobiles for their day-to-day -day needs and more able to, to walk to things that, uh, that meet their needs for, for social engagement, for just day-to-day -day shopping and, and uh, other needs like that. So um, we're cautiously optimistic, I will say, that we are making some strides toward uh, eliminating that affordability issue in our community. Um, and I'll entertain questions that you have. Yes, Jean. Um, this may be something that's already been d explored in some capacity, but I would be really curious as you talk about the affordable housing units that have been built and then filled with people with families who maybe don't have school aged children. Um, it would be interesting to look into potential partnerships. There are a lot of nonprofits that exist. I don't know if they're in our area, but. Um, that exists that specifically work to help place families who have kids under the age of 18 uh, into affordable housing units. It'd be interesting to look at potential partnerships with how families get placed into affordable housing. Um, I don't know if that's, I don't know what that looks like or who currently manages any of that, but I- Do you have access to um, who the CBOs are in this area that might do that? Yeah. I mean, I could get, I could get, I know specifically of several organizations that aren't technically in Gladstone, definitely in Washington County, some that I could get a list of. Yeah. yeah. That'd be helpful. Yeah. When we had that first um, uh, housing needs analysis program for the community in the end of 2018 that Bob attended and I attended, uh, we had representatives from, uh, from organizations that do I'm going to call it capital A affordable housing, meaning affordable housing that's either designed for certain income levels or subsidized in some manner. Um, when we speak generally about lowercase a affordable housing, that just means things that people can afford to buy regardless of what their income level is. And, and that varies no matter who you are. Um, I, I look at, uh, I, I get the real estate things. I get the, the feeds, the emails from Zillow. And you see what the prices are doing in Gladstone and understand why it is a struggle for people. Uh, but you're right. Uh, Metro has made available funding that goes to counties and, uh, and counties are slow in putting it out there to, uh, to get spent for this purpose. But I, I think that's a real good suggestion that, um, that if we, if we could target it for something that would help us with the need to boost our enrollment as well, uh, that would be a good direction to go in. And if we have any choice in the kind of places that we that we want to draw into this community, that may be a, a priority for us. Um, I can I can put together Alex. I appreciate that. It's really happy <laughs> to hear the parking zoning changing or change. And I think that may have happened a while ago and I forgot to, but just when I remember when we did the downtown revitalization planning, that was a hiccup. And in any of the plans of things we want to be able to do downtown Gladstone for to draw more people, you can't develop the downtown unless parking, the parking restrictions were oh, gone and some of our community didn't want to adhere to that. But now we were forced to do that. So they, they, didn't, they didn't like the idea of it. They didn't want to have any parking problems. <laughs> and I mean, it, we don't see parking problems on Gladstone. I don't, you know, on Portland Avenue, but I think um, the more our downtown core does become a place that people want to come and be, um, the the better people will know even Gladstone exists because it's hard to know it exists. Being on the news for attendance <laughs> um, helps Gladstone get you know recognized too because people you know are like I live in Gladstone. Well, where's that? You know the Harley Davidson sign. <laughs> <laughs> Like you ever saw. Yeah, like so it's people know Oregon City. I'm like, oh, it's near Oregon City. Oh, they know Oregon City, right? So it's just it's trying to get our little city on the map too. Sometimes I think it's all the things, right? Yeah. It's not any one thing. 
Yeah, for, for what it's worth, I also feel like one of the big challenges for our district is that we're in like a, a childcare desert. So like, you know, if there's any way of enticing either like a, a, a private childcare thing that can help support working families, or maybe, you know, it's a thought for, for the, the space that the library is vacating, you know, a community run childcare center would be massive benefit to this community as an enticement for young families to move in. So good for thought. I, I want to say one more thing about um, uh, that kind of relates to the facilities and, and other things. Uh, some of you back in January, well, I know Tracy was there. We had the dedication of the new playground at um, Meldrum Bar Park. Uh, we got some funding uh, through ARPA funds and also a, a grant through uh, Water Environmental Services that enabled us to put new playground equipment, went through a whole process engaging the community of what they wanted, and it went in. And it's been very well used, well, very well received in the community. But what well, one of the downsides to spending a lot of time at the elementary school is that you get very civic-minded students who come up to you and express their ideas. <laughs> and I was approached by a second grader uh, that I know and who said, why did you take down that playground at Meldrum Bar and put in a baby playground? And it's, it's valid feedback from an active <laughs> boy who really knows what he wants in terms of playground. And uh, so I, I thought about it and, uh, and I thought, yeah, the slide we used to have there was much taller than what we had now. And I remember being frightened when my own young grandchildren were on it. Uh, but I know this kid has been riding his bike to school and trying to be more independent and all that. So I thought about it the following week. I saw him at lunch and I said, I said, have you ever been to Selwood Park. They have a pretty good steep slide there. He says, he says, oh yeah, that's a good one. But he said, but the best, Errol Heights. And he mentioned a new park, several acres in, in central southeast Portland. Um, and so I went there with my grandchildren to see it and saw what, uh, you know, a 12 or 15 million, million dollar park looks like <laughs> in, in a city that has that much in accumulated um, uh, what do they call them? System development charges, you know, the, which is the funds that developers pay when you build something new. Uh, so I thought, well, yeah, uh, we could we could design parts that, that have a little more of those kinds of features. Uh, or maybe the school district, as part of your renovation, maybe some sometimes something like that will come up. And I was looking at um, the representative Anessa Hartman's Instagram page the other day, and one of her daughters, 12-year-old daughter, made a comment, we need more parks for teenagers. She's about to become a teenager. And I had just read an article online about a big park in, I think it was Philadelphia, that created a huge oval-shaped uh, swing set structure. Uh, it was like a continuous oval-shaped pole on the top with vertical poles, and there's like 20 swings all around the edge and people of all ages are using this swing because you can swing and see each other across from you. And so teenagers, adults, children with those big round things where you can lie back and look at the sky as you're going up are really engaging. And, and read a great article about how parks are now thinking about how do you design yourself to meet the needs of all different ages and all different abilities. And we put in a great playground at Meldrum Bar, which will meet the needs of families who have older children playing sports, but the younger kids really need something for them. And it was perfect for that. And the community got involved. Are you, are you, but it sounds like a functional outdoor environment. <laughs> a functional outdoor environment. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, 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 so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, adults love parks for different reasons than teenagers do and different reasons than children do. And I think that uh, you know, since we all share in outdoor facilities as part of what we do as, as leaders in the community, uh, let's keep that in mind and, and work together and, and be sure to, ch to share that kind of, uh, of feedback and input from our community and, and see where that takes us. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, we, uh, we may not have the budget to do what they do in some places, but we may do with what we have. Uh, you know, for a small school district, uh, the phrase that Bob always uses, and I've stolen it several times, is that we punch above our weight in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and as a city, we do as well. Uh, we have a bigger percentage of, of land devoted to parks than Milwaukee does. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. And so whatever ways we can involve our children and our youth in supporting our parks, 
And guiding our development, future development of parks, I think is, is a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Tracy? Yes. A couple more things. Sure. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Um, first of all, you, you know, I'm on my way out, so I can tell you guys everything you ought to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've, I've heard a couple of interesting ideas tonight. So just before this meeting, um, I'm on the Health Share of Oregon Board of Directors. And um, I'm, I'm the chair of the governance committee. And we received a report tonight about um, Medicaid as it is expanding uh, the role of Medicaid throughout uh, the state as being one of those roles of helping to facilitate um, many social issues and social needs. It's all part of their the larger scale equity stance within the organization. But um, I thought your comment, Jeannie, if you contacted CBOs about housing, because in the meeting I was in, CBOs were part of the overall plan for how that what that would look like in the metro area. Uh, Charlie, your comment about um, child care, and if there was a robust child care system within the community, what an asset that would be. And I'm just wondering if there wouldn't be an opportunity for this body initially um, to get together again after July 1st <laughs> to, to, have, to have a conversation about um, if we were going to become the community where families were trying to seek us out to live, what would it need to look like to do that? What kinds of things ought to be here to do that? And we mentioned a couple of really good ones in this meeting. And my guess is if you took that the next level up and you said, okay, those are good ideas. What other ideas? And you went through that whole process that you might just come up with some ideas that you could create a different vision that would be a joint vision between the city and the school district. Probably isn't done anywhere else. It would be a pretty cool thing to do. So anyway, that's my thought for you going forward. Uh, just one other thought. Um, what Jeremiah was talking about today with the long range facility plan, um, I'm 100% sure it will require a bond measure to do it. I'm 100% sure of that. I am absolutely cognizant of what the tax rate is in Gladstone. I know it. I absolutely know it. In 2006, when the board at that time made the decision um, to put that bond measure forward, they knew it. And there were some very fiscally conservative people on that board. But what they looked at is these places called schools within the Gladstone community that over decades, people had made significant investments in these places to protect an asset that they have in the community. The... Um, when the, when the bond is finally proposed, I am certain that the board will come up with a conclusion that it cannot raise the tax rate. They can't raise the tax rate. But we have a, 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 a bond levy that is cycling off in 2027. They'll all be gone in 2027. So it gives the opportunity to replace that with something that has a lower tax rate and still protects the assets of the community. So I hope you keep that in mind as you're moving forward and that um, the school district is going to need the support when it gets to that point of everybody point to the same thing. Man, we got to protect this community. And our schools are a tremendous asset in this community. And we've got to protect that. So that's my preachy thing for the night. So when we can reconvene on June 30th. <laughs> Sunday, I won't be here. <laughs> I know it came to me a little bit ago, Bob, that this is your last city council school board joint meeting, but you're welcome to always rock. What if our next meeting is at like a putt putt court? I know. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll, I'll just say that over all my years here, I've said this before to city council members. You have the you have the strongest leadership I've ever had across multiple departments within the city, um, and certainly your city administrator, but within the city council too. Um, you, you, you're taking this place, you're taking Gladstone to a place that hasn't been able to go to before you guys come on board to do it. So congrats to all of you. Hey.
and I have a similar comment. Um, as Jeremiah expected, uh, years ago, you could have left at any time in the last eight years, uh, but you stuck around long enough to make sure that you had strong administration at, at, at all your schools in the system. We have some new principals that are working out very well. One who escaped from an estacated district that just yesterday voted down a bond to, to approve their buildings. Uh, and I bet, I bet Amy's glad she's in Gladstone. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're glad we have her. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes timing is everything. And it, it's, it's good for this district that um, of all the, the years that you have put in and the great contributions and creative thinking that you brought here, that you've left us in a place, uh, left the school district in a place with very strong leadership as well. Uh, so uh, to have those they be coincidental is is great. Gladstone School District will continue to thrive. It will, but I believe yes. Well, and with that, it, there's other comments or it's a great meeting. Lot we lots of stuff. Um, got a lot of really great stuff from um, the Children's Center, and looking forward to having Jeremiah step in. And Bob, we're excited for you. We're sad. We're excited for you. Um, the one thing I'll just say super quickly about Bob that I've learned over working with him for seven years is every time I meet with him, I found out something new. Bob is one of the most humble men I've ever met in my entire life because there's so much to him that you don't know because he doesn't gloat and he doesn't tell you about it. And it's like, yeah, I'm on the sport. It's like, oh, well, write that one down too. <laughs> so, and, and, and Bob, you, you will always throw yourself under the bus for somebody uh, on the board I, that, that's not quite the way i want to say it but bob will always stand up for for his board for the people that he believes in for the for things he believes in and i know that again you are a very humble man but um there's just so much more to you um and the things that you have done for this district and for this city um a lot of people don't even know about because you don't ever want to you know and I can tell you're uncomfortable with me saying this right now, but, but I appreciate you. We appreciate you. And um, really you just don't even think about us. Well, you can think about us when you're, when you're, you know, on the night pole. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, with that, um, we will close down the Gladstone school board city council joint work session. Thank you all very much for Wednesday, May 22nd, 7 42 PM.